Thank you for coming specifically for this evening conversation with Mia Donovan on this September 11th, uh, 2021. Mia is a Montreal-based documentary filmmaker who has made three documentaries in the past decade. She won Best Documentary on Society and Humanity for her film Inside Lara Rocks at the 2011 Guangzhou International Documentary Film Festival and it was runner up for best feature at 2012 Boston Underground Film Festival. Dope is Death has been nominated for two documentary film awards. Mia works as a freelancer and is also involved in editing, teaching and consulting gigs. Uh, today, actually, just several hours ago, Mia received an award at NADA's Canadian Regional Meeting for creating the documentary film Dope is Death, which has brought depth, dialogue and greater understanding to the NADA community about the early beginnings of this revolutionary work. Uh, we have been talking about you, Mia, for a whole year, uh, and your film has really created a buzz in our community. And so it's really a, uh, a treat to have a conversation with you um, in this way, just with the NADA community directly. Um, so thank you so much for several things. Thank you for making the film available for viewing for our Canadian members for the last couple of days um, in conjunction with that regional meeting. And thank you for coming to this conversation. Um, we're really glad to be hosting you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this means a lot to have this uh, recognition. And, um, you know, I, after a year of mostly screening for film festivals. This is a, a much um, different kind of conversation for me to be involved in. And so it's, um, I'm, I'm thankful. So I wanted to just give a little bit of, of a setting for how we're gonna talk this evening. Um, this is really a Q&A format. So it's um, gonna be guided by questions that you have or have had um, uh, and allowing Mia the opportunity to respond. Um, and I invite you to place your questions in chat and then I will be moderating that and um, directing questions to Mia as we sort of go through them. Um, I wanted to just to begin, I wanted to share personally my own experience of watching the film. Um, and I realized I didn't introduce myself. So my name is Sarah Bursach and I'm not as executive director. And I first watched your film last summer um, in the time that it was available for screening. There was like maybe about a week or so that it was being offered. Um, I found the film, I, I felt very destabilized after watching the film. Um, and kind of numb in a way at the end of it, like, uh, do I know, what do I know? <laughs> do I know what I really know about Nada? Is, what do I not know about this work? Um, and I felt very kind of uncomfortable by that feeling, but also really grateful to be learning so much. And it kind of brought me into a quest to learn a lot more. And I just watched it this afternoon again, and I hadn't seen it in between. And um, I had a really different experience watching it. I felt like I understood the stories that you covered a lot better. And I've been following them more and learning about them more through our history series. But um, I felt so much more grounded and really just in awe of the film that you made. Um, it's really an incredible um way that you told the story, um, grounding it in the work of revolutionaries serving the people and from for the love of the people. And that really comes through so clearly in the film. So um, I guess my first question for you is, um, what brought you to this story? What brought you to this community to inspire you to make this film? Um, it's a uh... Sorry, I'm having a bit of problems with my microphone, with my earphones. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So it started in this weird way. Like I, I'm friends with the daughter of Mario Wexu, who was the acupuncture teacher, who started the, the Acupuncture Institute in, in Quebec with his father, Oscar Wexu. And I was getting a treatment from Mario. I have chronic migraines, so 
I went to go visit him and he had a post, he had uh, the poster of the Lincoln Detox on his wall. So it all started by seeing this poster and it obviously caught my attention because it says, we will fight heroin and methadone by any means necessary. And then there's like illustrations of black hands with acupuncture needles and mentions of the CIA and COINTELPRO and says the South Bronx, Dr. Matula Shakur. So I was like, started asking Mario about this. And he told me about how he helped these activists to learn acupuncture to treat drug addiction in the 70s. So, you know, I had, I didn't really know much about acupuncture or I, you know, I didn't know much about this history. So from that was 2012. And then I started to write Matulu Shakur and I started visiting him in 2013. So that was just, it started out of interest and surprise that nobody knew this history and just like curiosity. Um, I was going to LA to shoot another film. So I started, it started by visiting Matulu. And at first the project, so Mario Wexu has has had his own battles with addiction. And he kept, he told me that one day he hopes to reunite with Matulu and get treated for his own addictions with Matulu. So I had imagined this reunion that was going to happen in 2016 because originally Dr. Shakur was supposed to be released in 2016. So that was the original idea of the film was to have more of this like reu- reun- like film that reunited these two, this teacher student. Um, and then that, when, that, when Matulu wasn't released, that's when I got more involved in the act, act of, in, as an activist to you know, provide more of a counter narrative to who he is um, with his incarceration and to really like um, tell this amazing story that wasn't that well known at that time. There's been more journalists and more people writing about this history over the last six, five or six years. But when I first started, there really wasn't that much um, information out there. Mm. So I kind of rambled on, but yeah, it's, it's been so long that it's hard to really remember exactly how this, you know, project started in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like, that was a combination. It was really meeting Mario and then meeting Matulu. Mm-hmm. Um, there, uh, a couple of questions have come in. Um, one was, um, or one is, uh, is there a plan for the film to have French subtitles? And also there, do you can... Oh. No, no, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Uh, the second one was just, uh, if you would like to continue to make films about acupuncture activism. The film is released, uh, is available with French, French subtitles. So okay. um, it's, it's available in French subtitles, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, um, it's a, because a variety, of, I can't remember the list because um, it's been playing international film festivals. So we have a mm. bunch of subtitled copies, versions. Okay. Uh, and then that second question, uh, continuing to yeah. make films. Continue to make films, yes, but um, I'm not sure if I will. Uh, wait, right now what I'm focusing on is doing an impact campaign with Jopa's death which I spoke to Sarah about to help uh, organize some screenings beginning in New York to bring awareness for the expansion bills and also to bring awareness to um, the clemency petition for Dr. Matula Shakur. So um, that's what we wanna do for, we wanna focus on these type of event screenings over the next year now that we can do in-person screenings with Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to con- plan some more in-person screenings with panels and. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I was struck in the the film um, with the interview with Sid Davidoff. Um, you know, as the Mayor Lindsay's uh, sort of public relations guy. And it, what it made me wonder is whether in the research for your film or in some of your interviews, you had any chance to talk to Lincoln Hospital Administration. Um, Cause they were, it seems to me, they were both involved in trying to shut down Lincoln Detox um, from different angles. Um, I didn't, I, 
I've made attempts to reach many different people. My goal, I was trying to limit the interviews to people who had firsthand experience with the exception of Dr. Samuel Robert Kelton's. Kelton, everyone was somehow directly involved and um, it just didn't feel necessary. I was, I was trying to, to create more like a, a a, a political landscape to understand how acupuncture, how the need for, how acupuncture was a great tool for these activists in um, like towards self-determination. So I was more interested in, in the ideological political landscape than the actual, like investigating those sort of details with, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't, I had been in touch with somebody at the Lincoln Hospital, but not somebody who was familiar from that time. Mm -hmm. um, so it just didn't really make sense to go there. Um, but with Sid Davidoff, because he was on the ground and he was negotiating directly with Felipe, Luciano, and um, Yoruba and other activists, Cleo Silvers, it, and he remembered it clearly, that, that made more sense. And... So that worked out and uh, I wanted to have a little bit of, to give more insight into like how the city was, you know, dealing with um, these, with, with the community at that time. I can't even imagine that happening today. Like a, I can't imagine a bunch of young activists taking over any sort of city run or governmental run building and actually being able to negotiate to have mm -hmm. involvement in their own community decisions and healthcare and stuff. So that to me, like the story is just so inspiring. And there's just such a message of, you know, like the power people have, like when it, like the, the message of each one teach one and like just community involvement. So I think I was, that's what I was more interested in than this. So when it comes to the, mm -hmm. the NADA, the, his, the direct history of NADA, which it's more like the, the film focuses more on, you know, the landscape that gave birth to this acupuncture pr protocol because they weren't calling it NADA. I think that came in, that came in later, but right. so it's really like a prehistory in a way, mm -hmm. uh, actually. Yeah. Um, they did develop the five points together, but they were also doing a lot of other, it wasn't as standardized at that time, from my understanding, they were doing other points as well. And they started with just the lung point um, mm -hmm. and doing acupuncture pressure. So it was, um, so that, that's why, you know, and then at, in 1978, when, when Dr. Shakur and some of the activists went to Bana, they were focusing more on full body acupuncture than just, um, and then Michael Smith, what yeah. the other like stayed at Lincoln Hospital and just really focused on the five points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just a quick comment that when you, you use the term prehistory, which is a term we've used in NADA, it, the vantage yeah. point is from NADA. So I'm sure that from the pers from the perspective of activists, it wouldn't be considered a prehistory. It, it is the history. <laughs> um, right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. You're, and that's that's. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, um, how was it to interview Mario Webster for the film? Yes, he has seen the film. Um, um, he was, he was upset that he didn't have more um, recognition. Like he felt that the film didn't focus enough on his contribution to the history of acupuncture, but um you know it's it's he's he likes the film it's mario's a very passionate man and i've known him for a long time he's he's very reactive and then unfortunately COVID happened so we haven't i haven't seen him much but i'm hoping when we do have the montreal cinema screening in person screening with him that he will have a different feeling he'll feel more um I guess more <laughs> I feel like he will feel more that he is um 
I don't know how to say it. Like, I just feel like he was disappointed that he wasn't in it as much as he was. Hmm. But it's very difficult editing. It's because it's, it's about community and it's, there's a lot of stories and it's not, um, but, you know. Yeah. There was one other question that's been asked. Um, if you can talk about the archives you use, um, that it's so amazing what you were able to retrieve. Yeah, I mean, the archives was a huge, huge part of the research. It was, and I worked with an archival researcher, Edmund Duff, who knows how to navigate these large archives. It was very, it took years to find all this stuff. And also it was very complicated um, to license everything. And um, which was a whole, that's a whole, whole thing. But yeah, I mean, it started, I would meet, I would interview people and I would write down dates and events that they would mention. And then me and Eddie would try and, you know, just start searching and calling archival library researchers and just trying to figure out what, what kind of footage we could find. So oftentimes like they would, we would receive all this footage that some, some of the stuff like we didn't necessarily request, but we, they came to us and then we used that as something to focus the interviews around too. So it was like kind of part of the research. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it ended up being, you know, it's very expensive and complicated to use archives, but I felt it was very important to find a way to make it this way, <laughs> really give um, a perspective on the time, on um, bring us to like a place where we could understand the you know the the motivation for the actions that were really specific to I believe the early seventies. Mm -hmm. Well, and New York I, I, at that, that time. Begs that quite, the, this is a follow up question to what you're saying: is how long have you actually been working on the film? Um, it started like in a different in a different the the present version that's. Uh, what it's been since like 2016, but we started pitching the idea a few years before, but the, the original idea, which was more of a cinema verite project of Matulu being released back, um, mm. being released and continuing his work in the community and meeting up with Mario. So that idea was the original idea. Um, mm. And then, it, you know, we I, even before that, a, a year before Mat around 2015, I started visiting people in New York, mostly like the first few people were Walter Bosque and um, Dr. Michael Smith, actually. And so I started doing pre interviews in 2015 in New York and kind of just like casual, I didn't have any money to do actually like to film or anything, I would just meet people and, you know, get just start started to like write different treatments from there. So yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> I'm just um, reading the question. Hi. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hi, Mia. Hi. Hi, hi I'm uh, I'm Ken Su, the concurrent uh, president of NADA. Uh, this is my uh, second time around, but uh, but I actually trained at Lincoln in 1982, and you're absolutely right. I heard all sorts of innuendos about how it got started what happened, but the sense of uh, trepidation was still very strong. And, and as much as I would ask and pursue, no one would, would give answers. So I really appreciate saying this. And, uh, and I actually went to a medical school in Newark on the other side of the river. And, and, um, and you know, without knowing that was, was rubbing shoulders with, with um, a lot of the history you mentioned, but I guess as a medical student, I was left kind of in a um, naive world that, that I see as, as a positive thing now. But, um, but uh, currently I'm, I'm working uh, in the VA and the uh, leadership there is explicitly casting themselves as leading the way in transforming healthcare as a revolution in healthcare because now they're paying attention to whole health, whole person. You know, but obviously, mm -hmm. uh, as you laid out in the movie, this is Johnny come lately and uh, and coming from the top down. 
whereas it was severely repressed when coming from the, uh, the bottom up. Um, I'm, I'm warning about the um, health unity revolution, revolution. movement. Mm-hmm. And if some of those practitioners and doctors, is there a connection between them and what we're seeing that's evolved into now the largest healthcare system in the country? Basically putting a lot of money, emphasis, effort, time, training, and the whole health as the foundation of what they, they're, they're doing. Um, I wish I could directly answer that. I, um, Cleo Silvers could if she was here. Um, I believe that a lot of people involved in that, in, um, like for instance, um, one of the one of the early members of the Revolutionary Health uh, of Atrium was was the man, one of the doctors that started Doctors Without Borders. Um, I just, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but I feel like there are a lot of, if we were to do a history, which Cleo yeah. Silvers could tell us, there, I bet you there would be a lot of links out there, even from like people like Barbara Zellers, who you may have known at the time, um, who works in public health care. A lot of people involved in the, in the, the Lincoln Detox and then later Banna are still working in public health in some way, you know, so their influence, um, but it would be interesting to, to really like make a direct, you know, because there is Doctors Without Borders that's directly from that movement. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and, and Cleo, okay. Sorry. Okay, so Cleo perhaps Silver. we we can ask ask Cleo Silver sometimes in yes. the future. Uh, yes, because uh, she's yeah. yeah. So there's a follow up question to that as well because. Coming from the bottom up, the idea was always empowerment, self-determination. Now, of course, whole health is being talked about in the sterile terms of, you know, your family, your job, that's, which is a good foundation. But, uh, but I'm, I'm wondering um, what you think about a, um, the, the aspect of political education that might be reintroduced without the aspect of being so threatening that uh, they start to come after us again, come after me that's, again, <laughs> perhaps all of us, you know, so. That's a very, that's a very interesting question and something that's come up throughout shooting this film, making this film like with Naira, for instance, like um, even though Juan Cortez is, I consider him su- such a great activist, and community organizer, but he's from the beginning, they're like, we can't really talk about politics. It's like, um, but even though they live, you know, th- th- just by example and what they're doing, the work they're doing, it's, it is extremely political. Whereas obviously the Lincoln detox, it was so ex- it overtly, um, I mean, again, I think that's sometimes I think, oh, it was the times because it's coming out of like such a revolutionary era, but. Maybe I also feel looking back at like being not being around at that time. This is like uh, my mom's generation, but I feel like there, I have a nostalgia for that strong sense of political education and involvement that I feel has been diluted. I it's a it's a tough question because I don't think that that program could have been funded at any other period of time in history. Like it was just this little window where somehow they were able to run these very political classes for like seven or eight years. And, they, well, well, and, you know. and, and if I could ask the nature of the political classes, is it similar to what's being done today in terms of um, organizing around voting, teaching people about voter education, that sort of thing? I mean, that's my imagination of what the classes actually were, but do you know what the content actually was? Well, yes, um, from Yuria Wana Trinidad explained it to me as, so she, cause she was, continued to work in public health. She still works, as, she works in the acupuncture, but she's continued to work in drug therapy type group settings after Lincoln Detox. So she said in the political education classes during the Lincoln Detox days, they framed addiction in, social economic terms and um, you know, like really how 
the chemical warfare, dr how drugs and methadone were being flooded into communities like the South Bronx, poor black and brown communities to pacify political resistance. So they had, they really spoke in these terms and how um, after she, by the early eighties, when she was working at other city funded programs, they had to keep everything in the eye, like the personal responsibility, like you couldn't blame society. You know, it was like, so it, there was a whole shift that happened and she felt that, um, you know, that it was really difficult for her because there was a, a sense of empowerment and community, you know, like that's why people wanted to, were motivated to become community involved because they were able to really analyze the system of, and how it was oppressive and how it wasn't fair and, you know, all these things and that she just could not even talk in that, in that frame of at all you know, later on in any program that was funded. And I think that my experience with friends and family members who were in 12-step programs, it was all about their personal responsibility. And that's all I knew. So that was one of the things I found so fascinating when I first started learning about this history was just that frame. You know, I remember my stepbrother being in re group therapy at 13 and being told that nobody could ever, ever trust him again. You know, that, you know, it just, and I remember just thinking like, this is harsh, you know, he's like 13 and it's just like, right. he's going to spend the right. rest of his life just like begging for, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> forgiveness from everyone. <laughs> right, it's right, not right. very empowering. So anyways, like that's something that I think was the biggest. And then when I was going through some of the papers that um, from when actually Chuck Schumer was defunding, wanted to defunding is not the right word wanted to cut the program he had mentioned like they the, the fake PE classes like the political education classes and how like there was a lot of suspicion and you know there was other it, you can find them in the New York Times articles other people who were saying you know like the Lincoln detox was indoctrinating drug addicts into political radicals so you know there they were there was a threat about it and they had you know, they had these political posters all over the walls too. So it was very, it was very like in your face, I guess, for, for the time. But, it, but I think that's why it was effective because they were able to really sit down and just, um, you know, whenever I talk to anyone involved in the original Lincoln Detox, it's like the acupuncture, but the political classes are, it's like equally, the combination was what really made the program so unique and strong. Yeah, we've got a couple of other questions that um, I wondered if we can ask. Um, from Laurel, I'm curious about the transition time between Dr. Shakur and Dr. Michael Smith. Were they ever working together? Was there a concerted effort at that time to distance the Lincoln Center from its radical history? Um, well, from my understanding, it's that, um, well, they did work together. Dr. Michael Smith was, they when they were working at the Lincoln detox there, there had to be a, me a medical doctor to um, oversee, to, to, to like over, oversee the program. Is that the word? Like to, to, they, they had to have, they couldn't perform acupuncture without having a medical doctor on the team. He was yeah. there. Right. Yep. Yeah. And they all, um, they were all learning together. And then what, when, when they shut down the Lincoln detox, they tried, my understanding is that the Lincoln hospital, because they were all unionized, they tried, they split up all the activists up. So they removed them from Lincoln hospital and put them to different programs. And then Dr. Michael Smith was able to continue on with Lincoln detox, but without the political classes and with just, and then he developed the five points. And there was, I believe, you know, I, I don't, I did interview Dr. Michael Smith a few times that he didn't say it like this, but there clearly was um, a distancing from, from the, the radical, the, from the politics. And I think that was to continue the funding to, to get people off their back too, like to get, to get um, probably just to, people other people said it was a way to make to have the program survive it was like if we're going to keep this program going we have to just focus on the acupuncture and 
um, those that were still more politically motivated followed Dr. Shakur Tabana or others left. Um, so that's my understanding. Thank you. Another question um, from Katura, uh, those more intimately involved, what can we do to support the release of Dr. Shakur? Right, right now there is, um, he has been denied both the compassionate release and parole this year. So there is an active petition for clemency and on the website, matulashakur.com, it, um, you can find all the information there and his lawyer and the fam the lawyer, the legal team and the family and friends update all the time on call to actions. But right now that's what's happening is there's a, a push for, for this clemency. So if everyone can sign the petition, that would be great. And there's always need for financial donations for his legal fees and stuff. But all the information is updated there. So he's, it's, it's, you know, he's had a really rough year with cancer and COVID and, you know, it's, it's really heartbreaking that he was not released um, on compassionate release by the same judge who sentenced him in 1986 too, which is shocking. Or 1998, like 92 year old judge Hout, Hout. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, I'm just gonna post the website. So yeah, that's, and if anybody wants to write him letters, that would be great. He's still, he's doing stem cell treatment and he's, there's a lot, he doesn't have as many, um, there because of COVID they're more alienated at all. Like he doesn't see people as much. So I think he really appreciates letters and yeah. Thank you so much. Keep your questions coming. <laughs> I've appreciated people writing them in the chat. Um, I guess one, one question that I am wondering about is what, you know, you, you received this impact grant to have more screenings um, to track this better. From your own anecdotal experience, do you have a sense of kind of what impact or outcome your film has already had in, in not just our community, but perhaps wider, um, wider communities? Well, I think uh, like one, I think that the recognition it, with NADA is huge for an impact and other, I mean, there's been a lot of community screenings online over the last year. It's, it's hard for me to measure because I haven't really been able to attend. The only screenings I've attended was the, the, the premier screenings at the first festival the week before COVID and there it was three sold out screenings and from that screening Dr. Shakur got so many letters and donations mm -hmm. and you know it was really great I, uh, we had Juan Cortez was there so I know a lot of people were asking him about how they can get involved with NADA there was a lot of acupuncturists there um, so there was that was great um, we just got an impact campaign with chicken and egg pictures and they're also mentoring it mentoring this outreach program which we just started so we want to focus on the issue of expanding help to help expand the bill to expand the acupuncture bill and also to continue to raise awareness about political prisoners Dr. Shakur and you know so we're kind of just unfolding it unrolling it and hoping with the goal of creating in-person screenings with panels which we're working on the first one for late October or November in New York. Um, and then from there. So, you know, it, there'll be more updates and the updates will also be on metulushakor.com. And we also have the pod, a podcast that we did about um, on called Dope is Death, the podcast, which goes a bit more deeper into Dr. Shakur's put like, the context of his political case and um, a little bit more on the side of like the, the, the politics that 
have led to you know, the RICO case and, and the issues around Dr. Shakur, mm -hmm. where we interview his lawyer and some um, individuals who weren't necessarily involved with Lincoln Detox, but more with his political work. So um, we did that last summer as our, you know, con COVID uh, confinement project. So. <laughs> Well, certainly, um, I think also it affected the creation of our history series, which we've run um, all year long. And we're planning to have our last event on uh, Friday, November 12th, last event of this year. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it had a very direct impact in that way of, of, of making a choice to examine that um, history as it relates to the founding of NADA and how do we, um, how do we kind of embrace the narrative in a much different way than this organization has for many decades? And what does that mean for us as an organization today? So um, I think it's been a really valuable discussion and I feel like there's miles to go yet, um, but it has begun. See you again. <laughs> I, I heard um, allegations of um, misappropriation of funds in the early days, certainly after NADA was founded, that same issue uh, came up as a certainty. Uh, I'm wondering if there was any reality in those early days of where anyone had any concern like that, or is that just kind of a rumor that may have been manufactured that is floating around? But, uh, but of the primary sources, was that ever a concern? Um, you mean, uh, as a, I don't know how I, I would say concern directly, but I do know that that was part of the reason why they shut the clinic down. And there is some documents I have about this. If, um, if you are, if you're really like curious of digging into the history. So it was there, it, I, my, the way I, it's been explained and the way it seems to make most sense is they were trying to compare the cost that Lincoln Detox was spending per patient as a, compared to methadone maintenance programs and based on the amount of people they were seeing. And a lot of it was, was, was trumped up. Like the, the Lincoln Detox workers didn't have access to the accounts, but they were making it seem like they were like misbilling, like billing. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to think clearly about it. Like there was, it, it was stuff like, like phone, there was things like that. There was like allegations like, oh, your phone bills were like $1,800 because you were calling San Francisco or like it was these kind of things added, like a bunch, a list of things that was in this document and like a refusal to bait. I think there was also something about they wanted, they didn't want to um, something with Medicare. So if people were coming in and they didn't have their like information, they would still, they would just say, okay, there was 10 patients at that time, but they might have only had the information for two. So then they were saying, oh, you're making it up. It just kind of like, it sounds like it was part like, there was probably some mismanagement, uh, not mismanagement, but things were, it sounds, it, the way the clinic was described, it was some practitioners said it was like MASH, like the movie MASH, like it was chaotic, there was people coming in, it was like this really active, vibrant space with a lot of things going on. It was a really vibrant community space and that they weren't necessarily, you know, like hospitals weren't used to people just kind of coming in, getting treatment, not having everything the paperwork as, you know, it just sounds like a lot like that. It just, it, it was just kind of run, um, like there was in a way, but they were trying to accuse them of like, oh, you're not really doing medicine. You're like ripping mm -hmm. us off, which was not the case. So these sort of, the health and hospital corporation was, it seemed like trying to find a way to cut the program. And so they just kind of were able to make up, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was like, it, but I do have this document um, about 
the the reports, like a copy of the report. That that'd be great, and and that makes yeah. sense. That explanation makes sense to me. That the establishment wouldn't understand what yeah. they were doing. I, yeah. I know when I first left medical school to go study at Lincoln, people thought I had lost my mind. Why do you want to study with that quackery? It's nothing. So if they're actually billing and it's busy and it's and it's it's on and popping, I mean, they wouldn't have um, understood and um, and would choose to uh, repress as opposed to really look at the uh, the evidence. So thank you. But I, I would like to see that report as well, if, if we could. Yeah, and also what, one other point is that, that that was mentioned was that once they stopped, because in the beginning they were still dispensing methadone and then they were slowly just people, they were, because they were funded as a methadone program, but as they were at the time there was methadone maintenance and methadone detox. Okay. So that's how they first got off the ground and they would do the 10 day detox. And then when they started, the more they started to introduce acupuncture, the people were just bypass would bypass the methadone and they had more confidence in just the acupuncture. Okay. So once then it became like, well, how, you know, what are you doing? Like, is this real medicine? What's going on there? Like how they couldn't prove like they, they were, so there was some, like, how do you, just to, how do you keep getting funds for a methadone detox when you're not using methadone? Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. were that politically opposed. So there was there was a bunch of factors. So and then how do you quant okay. qualify? Like how do you say how do you quantify? Is that the word? Like how do you say like we need this much per patient when it's a few needles? Because they don't understand the infrastructure, the the other work. Exactly what you're saying. Like they did, you know, the hospital didn't understand what they were doing and it was very easy for somebody like if you look at the New York times articles for it was assemblyman um, Chuck Schumer at the time who was just like, this is a rip off cynic. There's something, this is like a, this is like not real medicine that's going on here. Okay. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it was a mess. I mean, you know, they, and they had it, they fought a lot. There was, they took over the health and hospital corporation. I, in 75 so they were you know they really fought to keep the program going they in their like in a way that was very um direct you know protest mm -hmm. mia somebody asked um if you receive nada often and do you like it <laughs> i have received it i love it i bet i haven't re i received it the first time i went to film with Juan Cortez at Naira and I was with my camera person Glauco and you know I, I was just he was like oh let me give you some nada and I was like no no I'm cool because like I wanted felt like I had to be really focused and then finally and I'm always a little stressed out when I'm doing a new project I think it's just normal like you're like okay do you want to make sure everything's working and then and yeah it, it was amazing like I felt so like immediately just like chill and I was able to sit in the room for a couple hours as different people were coming in to receive the acupuncture and just like seeing people like kind of stressed out and a little edgy and then one would put the needles in and then everybody would just sort of like chill out. So I'm really glad I got to experience it like on day one. And I was just like, okay, I get it. You know, like it's really, there's just something here. It's just like, you know, it's, we don't, it's so hard sometimes just to remind like, just to breathe, you know, <laughs> calmly. So yeah, it was, and I have gotten it several times from Juan and uh, Walter in, when I'm in New York. Hello. Hi, this is Laura. It was really hard for me to watch. Um, I don't know who it was, the person that went into the abandoned Lincoln Hospital. Um, that was- Walter. Like, yeah, that was hard because, you know, you having walked those halls and, and just felt the vibration of how positive it was to so many people. Uh, that was hard to watch. That It was just kind of discarded. There is a group in the Bronx called Bronx Unite there that are trying to get, because the city owns that building, to get this building um, turned into a community space. Uh, so they're the ones that helped us get access to this building. So that nice. would be great. 
Yeah, I think that they're in a, I don't know if they're in a fundraising process, but they do have a plan drawn up for having it be a community um, kind of art space, it's kind of a community space, um, not necessarily just healthcare related, but. It's a yeah. huge space and it's just been abandoned for like, I don't know how long, 10 years or more. Hmm. I think that's about right. Almost maybe exactly 10 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering your, your thoughts about uh, what you've learned, what you might advise uh, NADA as an organization, uh, the board, me, and in terms of um, our wish to do more in terms of restorative justice in terms of, of really, um, you know, given the uh, title of the history series, come back full circle with the, with the protests now, you know, in, in the street for um, equality and health care, um, um, all of that. Uh, what advice might you give, not currently, to be more effective, more pointed, strategic uh, in terms of of, of the tradition we wish to carry on to continue to push whole health care uh, because all of that is part of whole health. And even though the mainstream medical establishment has come aboard as a Johnny come lately, um, we want to continue to push the envelope for whole health care, which does involve the whole person, which includes restorative justice, uh, helping victims as well as victimizers, even working with the uh, um, police force and, and the whole um, corrections uh, industry, all of that, what advice and insights might you give us if we are looking to have a positive impact uh, on that, that is so important to black and brown communities, especially? That's, a, that's such a big question. Um, I don't think I'm qualified to really answer that, I, my role is I'm hoping in, you know, like digging, putting together this documentary and um, contributing to the, the, the history, the narrative, the history that that helps to inspire and um, it does. to motivate. And I think that, you know, what fascinates me so much with uh, when I learned about this was just these were such young activists. These were like 19, 20, 21 year olds who had really direct solutions to the problems. In the, like they did what they could in a really direct way. Um, and even it's not in the documentary, but it's in the podcast. Like they talked about how they, when they first started doing the young lords, when they first started doing community work, they would go door to door and ask everybody what they needed done and their first call to action was the garbage initiative and they were like they were kind of disappointed they're just like that's what you want us to do like we're revolutionaries you want us to like deal with garbage but that was like how you know it started and I think that you know I think that there's something about and my experience being at Naira with Juan it's just like so just that personal contact and talking to people and seeing, I think that's what's great about harm reduction, meeting people where they're at, you know, and um, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's, it, it is a big thing. There's I, just coming, also coming from Canada where we have universal health care. Um, and there's certain issues that I learned a lot. Like I just can't, I, since I started having friends in the U S like um, I've always thought like this idea of having to worry about health care insurance, like such a, odd thing like such a stressful yeah. like just you know like it's something that you know I took for granted before here but now it's like I really don't have to worry about going into debt if I get really sick or something um but I think I just learned so much like from it's hard to really just sum it up but I feel like this film has really transformed me and understand also white privilege and just just things in society that um you know I see a lot differently and it's the the big thing right now that's the still the painful thing is just to see how 
Dr. Shakur is still incarcerated and just how many people suffered during that period at the hands of the counterintelligence program and for their work. And I think that yeah. that's something too with Black Lives Matter, when we think about just like the history of, just like the, the, the length that this government went to repress people. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I think that, you know, Nada, I, I really hope that if, if Dope is Just can do anything to help expand the, spread awareness to help get these bills expanded or anything that's I hope that that can that can happen but I have got um, lots of emails from young acupuncturists all across the U.S. who are so interested mm -hmm. in that can you pass them on to Sarah yeah yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you that sounds good <laughs> uh, and, oh, and uh, Keep an eye out for the folks in Canada as well that have similar yes. sentiments. So. Well, that's one thing that was so great today. I, I uh, attending today's um, meeting was to, like, uh, you know, to see what's going on in Canada because, you know, I was focusing on just the history, and now I'm like hoping to, you know, do impact screenings here as well in Canada, right. 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 and um, so and and to see that the same issues. The, it seems to be the the, the laws are, are still a problem here as well in certain provinces. Yep. Uh, to answer Laurel's questions, yes, uh, the links will be added to notes when we uh, create the recording for this. It will be sent out to everyone who registered and um, most likely posted on our website as well. And then we always include everything that we shared. Um, so um, thank you so much for both coming to the meeting earlier today and for having this Q&A with us. Um, I see that some folks are saying that already in the chat. Um, it's really just, uh, we don't get a lot of opportunities to have um, these kinds of conversations about our history. Um, even in the history series, we are really wanting to hear from firsthand accounts of people. And so um, it doesn't create quite as much dialogue like this. And so I really appreciate that that happened this evening and that you're, you know, very candid and honest about what you know, what you don't know. You know, you're really um, uh, clear about that and, and very open to share. So we appreciate that. Yeah, I'm really happy to meet you all and to uh, to just to see that you know, I, I think at the beginning I was intimidated about what you guys would think about the film, just because it's, it's, but so I'm, I'm happy that, um, to talk to you guys. And if anybody wants to reach me, um, you can email me at, um, me yeah, at istillfilm.com. Like for Kenzu, if you want to follow up on that research um i'm happy to share whatever research i have thank you thank you that's just uh that's yeah because i have so much research and you know so much just 90 minutes not even 90 minutes in the film <laughs> great great right but um thank you guys and i love what you guys are doing and um i'm glad i can be part of you know help out in this way and yeah thank you Thank you, thank Sarah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, take care, everybody. Have a good rest of the evening and weekend, and uh, take a look at the movie if you haven't yet. <laughs>